Well, a very good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session, Selling the North to the World. Uh, my name is Michael Taylor. I work by day at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, I'll be joined by the other panellists on this session very, very shortly. Um, what we want to do today is finish this fantastic event, Invest North 21, with a few reflections and a few insights and a few stories about the North's cultural assets, what we can do to maximise them, how we can all you know, emerge from this pandemic and enjoy what the North has got to offer, be that Blackpool Tower, uh, Manchester International Festival, a visit to one of our favourite football teams, and we'll be have one of those represented, or looking at the great hills and the great outdoors of places like the Lake District and Yorkshire and the North East. And I, for one, I'm a, a very keen outdoors person. I like to to get out into the into the hills of the Peak District near where I live, part of the North, of course. I also like to visit the Lake District, and I've certainly got in my mind a few mountains that I, I want to climb when we emerge out, out of this. So I'm just waiting for the rest of the panellists to join us. Um, I'm sure they'll be coming along very shortly. Uh, I'll introduce them when you'll be able to see them, and I know which ones have managed to make the transition in this digital world. I hope you've enjoyed the the, the event so far today. today we've... we've uh, uh, Hello James. Hello, James. Very, very, very much, much welcome, welcome to, to, um, um, welcome welcome to, this. to this. Hello. Hello, Kerry. Hello, Kerry. Hello. Hello, 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 Colette. And, and we're just, we're just waiting, waiting uh, for, for Shona Sh Sh Southern, Southern from Marcus in Manchester. Manchester. Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. Great stuff. Now, so I'm now getting, I'm a, bit getting a bit of echo from one of you, so it might be appropriate for you to be on mute when you're not talking, because unfortunately it's, it's it's not happening now. So I think it might have been you, James, but if you've gone on mute, it can't have been. But anyway, without further ado, this is for the benefit of the people at home and the people watching this fantastic conference. Um, what, a, what a year it's been. So I'm joined by... Um, by Kerry Thomas from Merlin Entertainment, the um, the owners of Blackpool Tower, amongst many other assets, and critically in the north of England, it is indeed Blackpool and Madden Two Swords that you own, isn't it, Kerry? Yes. So we've got a number of attractions in Blackpool. You say the Blackpool Tower and all of that um, that it encompasses. So we have a circus, a ballroom, uh, which many of you may know from Strictly Come Dancing. We've also got Madame Two Swords and over 2,000 fish in sea life. So it's quite a diverse portfolio we're operating from fish to wax. And of course, many people across the north of England and from different points in Lancashire would have been able to see you lighting up Blackpool Tower yesterday in yellow in marking the respect for the day of reflection that uh, hopefully we all managed to participate in. So thank you to you and your colleagues for, for doing that in such a, a bold and iconic way, reminding us about how important Blackpool Tower is to our location. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce Colette Roche. Colette Roche from Manchester United. Um, I, I first met Colette when you were working at Manchester Airports Group. Um, so you're obviously very well invested in the cultural assets of uh, the north of England. Colette, how do we find you today? And what's the mood in the camp like as the players go off on international duty, uh, hoping to return without injuries and um, infections, no doubt? Yeah, I mean, we're in a good mood, I think it's fair to say. Um, Michael at, at United at the moment, um, performing well, both on and off the pitch. Been tough for everyone, I think, this year. But as you say, always a risk with some of our players going internationally. But Hopefully we've got the right processes and protocols in place so they can get back safely and soundly so we can uh, try and get closer to the other the other Manchester team in the in the Premier League. Oh, who are they? Who are they? <laughs> and, and and Shona Southern. Shona, welcome. Um, great to have you on the panel. I, I feel like I've seen you as, as much in the last week as I've seen some members of my own family who've been distributed around the world during this lockdown. I'm not able to see them. I saw you give a great presentation to the all party parliamentary group on culture last week so uh, thanks for sharing that and um, i'm really pleased that you've joined the panel today uh, shona how are you how's the team at marketing manchester yeah it's uh, it's been a tough year but we've just had a session today actually wrap it, wrapping up what we're um active now and i'm pleased to say that we've for the last month we've been active in markets but although virtually 
with our key markets warming up the travel trade and the press um, uh, on the investment side you know digital innovation we've had some big launches and with cop coming up so i think there's lot lots of optimism in the uh, looking forward to over the next year but god it's you know it's been a tough year it has it has yeah. indeed for everybody and again thank you to all your team for 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 flying the flag for Manchester in the north of England. Just as I'd like to extend that thanks to James Mason from uh, Welcome to Yorkshire. James, welcome to the Invest North 21 conference. Um, how do we find you today? I'm afraid you're on mute, James. It's the last one of the day, so of course I'm on mute. Uh, yeah, I've probably just given some of your a heart attack because I was caught in some, uh, shall we say, internet traffic, uh, trying to jump out of one call to another, but yeah. Like, like Shiona said, and same, similar with Kerry and Colette, we're all adapting to a strange world, but we're just raring to go, aren't we? You know, we've got lots to be thankful for, lots to be appreciative of, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the next hour. Fantastic. Well, it's not, not quite. We've got about half an hour. But um, so I'm, I'll, in fact, I'll start with you, James, while you've got your microphone uh, unmuted. Um, so I'm going to ask this question of all of you. I think it's something that you can all um, contribute to. How do you think the North is seen around the world? What does your research tell you? What do your customers and visitors say? How is the North seen around the world? And, and what, what are the assets that we're looking at that we're looking to maximise? Quite an apt question, Michael, because I've just been down to the Northern School of Contemporary Dar Arts, which is a, which an arts institution, higher education institution that's got international students from all over the world. So uh, I asked them exactly that question. Now I was coming here today and, and I don't know if the North has a, a perception across the world. You know, it, it may be internally and in, in, perhaps across the UK. But, um, you know, I think we talk about Yorkshire and then Lancashire and Manchester and I suppose the North is probably a little bit further than us to some extent, but I would th I would say there's probably some common themes. You know, a real industrial heartland um, for for a number of reasons, uh, but also a, a, a part of the country that really um, has a real dichotomy of, of landscapes. You know, beautiful countryside, and then really brownfield urban sites, some vibrant cities like Liverpool, uh, uh, Newcastle, Leeds, Manchester. So I think I think when the, the, we speak to people about what the North means, they always say one thing: really hardworking, really down to earth, and really friendly. Now, if they're if they're USPs to use going forward, let's use them if that makes sense. But yeah, real dichotomy depending on wh where you're classing the North as. Yeah, lovely, um, James and um, Shona. Can I come to you on this on this question very deliberately? Um, does, does Manchester have a, a distinctive brand separate from that of the North? I mean, when, when, you know, when we're thinking about that question about how the North is seen around the world. Uh, I guess it does. I think Manchester is, you know, it's the heart of the, of the North. And I think this year, more than ever, you know, COVID, Brexit, and, and with a bit of footy put in there, that's dominated the landscape this year. Um, you know, and perhaps COVID, um, we might not be seen as favourably in terms of the UK and, and abroad. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on, on that side, you know, the, the getting back our market. So, but I think there's different markets, different perceptions. I think more mature the market is like the EU and the US. Uh, mature markets, they've wandered out of London. They're quite happy to come up to the north and Manchester. So we've got some good traction there um, across all our cultural and sporting attractions. Um, further afield, a bit more China and GCC countries, they're getting to know us a bit more. Um, and then into domestic markets, I think perhaps sometimes we get knocked in terms of perceptions probably from within the UK <laughs> than compared with our uh, international markets. I think there's still some work to do there and this year is a real opportunity for domestic markets so i think we can make up some ground there i think with streaming live streaming the north is a brilliant place for any film so we can see you know harry potter and peaky blinders has just been down in castlefield last uh, month uh, in manchester filming um there's a film called the circle that's been filmed in salford right across you know liverpool with stranger and right across yorkshire so we're a great location for film so i think that that takes is a different kind of way it gets it cuts through uh, barriers and more importantly with the BBC relocation 10 years ago to Salford that's changed the mind of a lot of people in the UK and with the announcement last week of 500 more jobs coming up I think we see more regional voices on the telly it helps 
and not only that it's the regional um stories that come in so i think that that can be uh, seen as much better in terms of improving perceptions across the the gritty north now colette if i could come to you if i may um you you're obviously um work for one of the best known brands in the world if not certainly one of the best known brands in football but also one of the best known brands in the north of England. And may, many people will come to Manchester, to Old Trafford, to watch a football match. But it's obviously an opportunity for you to work with colleagues like Shona to showcase what else people can do when they when they come from overseas, both as a, an away supporter. But, you know, I think um, joking aside, Manchester United's fan base being global. I mean, you can't get a hotel room when United have got a Champions League game during the week or often at the weekends with... And I've got a flight in from from Dublin and Belfast as well on a Friday, and it's you know it's full of support. You, you clearly have an international fan base. What more can you leverage around that? And what do those people tell you about how the the rest of the north is seen, and promote opportunities for them to do other things than just come along and watch United? Yeah, I mean you're right, Michael. We're fortunate enough um, to probably be the the sort of you like. The biggest club in the biggest league in the biggest sport so that does give us a huge following i think last count was 1.1 billion follow fans and followers across the globe so fantastic platform if you like to engage across the whole um whole of the world in a lot of the areas i know we as a northern region have been trying to reach and connect with for quite a long time so um yeah i think you know we have got a head start with that interesting what you say about the hotel occupancy so um our stats tell us that typically in Manchester pre-COVID, you might have had sort of 70, 75 percent occupancy, occupancy on a um, obviously on a, a non um, a non-match day, but it is 99, 98 percent on match day. So, I think in total, in terms of what not just United brings, but actually what football, um, dare I say it, the, the the blue side as well bring is fairly significant. And I think. Somebody once said to me that the economic value of having football in Manchester is equivalent to having the Olympic Games every four years. So, you know, you're talking about £1.2 billion worth of, of GBA to the economy. So I think it play, plays a huge part. Going back to what you said, people don't just come to watch a football match. We do know people that come to watch a match at Old Trafford. One in eight um, international travellers come to Manchester, watch a match at Old Trafford. But we also know 250,000 come to see the museum and tour. Um, and I know City have got something similar and have Liverpool and some of the other clubs. So um, I do think that it's a good pull, if you like, for the international visitors. Um, but what we also know is the spend per visitor when people come across for football tends to be higher. So typically it's £600 for an international visitor into Manchester. If they're coming to watch the football, they tend to spend 800 So. All in all, wow. I think it's a good, it's a really, really good, good plug. What do they think about um, for, uh, the North? Well, it's interesting because it works both ways. I know um, when I used to go out with, as the MD of Manchester Airport to sell the North and connectivity, it used to quite, it used to sadden me at the time because I didn't work for Manchester United when I'd say we're from Manchester and they'd say, oh, Manchester United. Yeah, yeah. Whereas now that's great. But um, I think, you know, going back to what James said earlier, I think there's some really good values that certainly we as a whole as a club that are very true to the North, which is hard work and resilience, you know, no nonsense, um, creative. And actually, I think people are starting to to use that and see that as a bit of a more northern edgy brand. Um, and, and I think that, again, is, is a good pull of a place to to live and work and play. Fantastic. And Kerry, um, obviously, from your perspective as as marketing, the, the assets that you've got, at Merlin Entertainments from in Blackpool. Um, how, how do you think the rest of the North is seen? And what, what the visitors say to you? What else do they do other than coming to sample what they've got in you know the North's premier seaside resort? Yeah. So I think, you know, as the other guys have said, for me, the North is seen as many different heritage aspects, but not necessarily seen as the north it's not kind of grouped together you know manchester united is is renowned and in, in terms of blackpool we're the biggest kind of uk seaside resort we have over 18 million visitors a year um yeah. but it is quite disparate in that people either see blackpool as a home of entertainment and heritage or manchester as a home of football but rarely do people see 
the North as, as one kind of joint offering. And I think over time, you know, all of those uh, visions and views of the North have, have kind of shifted. You know, once upon a time, Blackpool was was very much at the forefront of entertainment. And, you know, there's this lovely story about Frank Sinatra used to come to the UK on his, uh, U, well, on his world tour and he would come to one destination and he would always choose Blackpool over London because at the time it was seen as yeah. kind of the entertainment capital. Um, for us, it's interesting because obviously over the years that's changed and entertainment and culture is now more widespread than it once was. So we're kind of, you know, fighting the fight to get ourselves put back on that map and put back on that destination. Um, but I think very much we tend to see visitors coming and uh, kind of talking about those main points of Manchester United, the Lake District, kind of the key selling points. But, you know, there's so much more to offer across the north other than you know kind of those key locations and I think it's very easy for international travellers to come to London and know that they have their itinerary set and they're covered for a one to two week break yeah. for us is you know kind of northern destinations it's a little bit more difficult than that you know people might yeah. come to Manchester for a match for a couple of nights but they don't necessarily have a mapped out itinerary of you know all of the wonderful things they can see and do because I think those kind of cognitive associations don't exist that pre kind of defined vision of the north just isn't there we haven't done enough to kind of bring everything together as one well that that brings me on to my next question Kerry and if you could just keep your microphone on because I think it moves nicely is how are the north's cultural assets and brands therefore best used to promote the region how can how can you work with Shona and James to really promote the North and what, what new assets could, um, could we look to really enliven? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, it's, we almost need to find the, the categories where there is crossover amongst the areas that we uh, kind of live and work in. We can be quite distracted by, you know, I am Blackpool through and through. Uh, but, you know, just taking heritage as an example, in Blackpool, we have, you know, the Blackpool Tower, a grade one listed building. We have the Blackpool Tower Ballroom, the home of Strictly Come Dancing that, you know, a lot of our international travellers have come here for. Um, and then you look at, say, Yorkshire, they've got more grade one and two listed buildings than London do. And as a North combined, we've got more than double what London does. Um, but we never, you know, kind of portray it in that sense. And I think, you know, the, the DMOs have such a, a tough job looking after their areas and their regions and and we all have things yeah. that we need to drive and deliver but sometimes we maybe need to take a step back and say you know it, from a domestic market market it is manchester versus yorkshire versus but from an international market how do we bring yeah. all of them together to be a region rather than kind of a a smaller area Kerry, that's a really bold ask, and I'm going to bounce this the, the next, this question on to Shona, uh, and then I'll bring James in, if that's okay. So the North's cultural assets. Shona, in your presentation I saw last week, I think you quoted a figure of $130 billion as potentially the value to the cultural economy of the North. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's huge. We've got so much to offer. And I do think, going back to Kerry's point about collaboration, I think I collaborate with everyone on this this call now. Uh, and what we've done in the past, we've you know worked with Yorkshire and Leeds, Lancashire, um, Newcastle, Cheshire, Cumbria on our international campaign. So what we try and do is do it together. So we and, and we usually lead, you know this usually football isn't there Colette, in terms of what we lead with. Uh, I think the forgotten stuff that you know we're people think they can't get vegetables in the in the north. You know our cuisine <laughs> is brilliant. Uh, we've got the most Michelin star restaurants outside of London and in the Northwest. You know, we've got great food and drink. We've got mo probably more bars than everyone put together. Um, our music is phenomenal. So we've got a cult cult cultural heritage in terms of music venues, which I'm looking forward to get, get back to. Yeah, me too. Uh, but, but no doubt, you know, sport does dominate because of those brands, you know, the premiership brands across the North. But not forgetting that, sport... Um, other brands. We've got lots of national governing bodies in in the north, located in the north. We've got British Cycling, of course, and we do bring in those other big, um, big events. So we had the Cricket World Cup, which, you know, the eyeballs on that Pakistan versus India game was yeah. brilliant for the north yeah. because it showcased, um, you know, the north. We've got the Rugby League World Cup this year, fingers crossed. 
And that, you know, the games for that, there's 85% of the games in the north. So again, that's, you know, eyeballs on the north, which I think to you know, points of trying to lift that. But not to forget the more, um, the other new year events we've got this week, we've got a behind closed doors of the para power weight world championships happening in Manchester okay. this week. So all of those, you know, all the para um, sports that we've been bidding for through our major sports bidding units. Um, you asked about new culture attractions. Mm. So I just can't wait for all, all our existing attractions to open yeah. up. But we have got some new ones on the, you know, yeah. in, in the in the long distance future, the Eden of the North, we've talked about at Morecambe, which would be phenomenal. We've got a new attraction opening in um, Manchester this year in Salford. So it's the RHS Bridgewater. It's a massive garden. The walled garden alone, you could fit in RHS Chelsea into the walled wow. garden. It's, it's a massive pool. Uh, the factory will open a couple of years' time, which will be the home of the International Festival, which we're all waiting for. And some might not know, but there's a second arena going to open 2023, which is in East Manchester. So that'll be the biggest venue in the in the in the UK. In addition to that, we've got a Thermae Wellbeing Resort, resort at Old Trafford. And I think this is going to be, uh, I don't think the Northerners will know what's hit them. It's built as an ancient Roman spa meets the indoor tropical paradise. So it's a luxury spa experience, right, okay. which is like a little mini holiday. So that's something for the Trafford Centre. So there's plenty to go out there. But, you know, go back to in terms of cultural perceptions, we've got a long way to go. Um, in terms of m moving those cultural perce perceptions, particularly in in this country, and I think we should use this period of coming out of lockdown to to do that. Yeah, fantastic, James. Is there anything that you'd uh, push back on with what Shona says? No, not at all. I, I'd echo a number of things that I've heard there. I just had some notes before this this meeting, knowing that we'd be asked these questions. So, heritage, food and drink. So, as Shona said, you know, more Michelin style restaurants and outside London. We've got seven in Yorkshire. Film and TV, so Peaky Blinders, Gentleman Jack, All Creatures Great and Small, all these um, northern programs. And you tell me if you're in Chicago or New York that you can differentiate between the Yorkshire Dales <laughs> or the Peak District. Or anyway, you can. So, yeah. and, and interestingly, the question about north and south is where does the south stop and where does the north start? Where does the Midlands fit into it? You know, because we, as a region, we would, uh, as you Yorkshire region, we'd go down as far as Sheffield. And there you've got, you've got the Sheffield Winter Gardens, you've got the, the, the best wildlife park in the whole of the country outside perhaps Chester or London Zoo. So where do you start and where do you stop? And I think Kerry's point about, you know, how you group the North together is, is best described as, you know, lots of commonalities, lots of um, points of difference. But I don't think anyone outside of England refers to the north of England because we're, you know, you're bringing in Scotland then. So I think that's a challenge in itself. And probably we shouldn't get heads up about that. You know, I don't think it's a, it's a big issue. It's just nice to be part of the north. But within that, you've got Manchester, Liverpool, Sheffield, Newcastle, etc. Uh, people, definitely. People separate us from the rest of the world without fact. So if you've gone into Manchester or Blackpool, uh, uh, Liverpool, Sheffield, you are going to get a type of person. And I think we all know what that is. Hard to describe but homely, hospitable, uh, sense of humour, um, industrious, hardworking, but also, yeah. you know, very, very, very defined. Uh, national headquarters, I'll just finish on this, Michael. Channel 4 moving to Yorkshire, BBC at Salford, moving also to Leeds, Skybet, McLaren. Uh, we've got cities like York that are the greenest cities in the country. We've got Hull that's the, the most technologically advanced in terms of, um, you know, uh, 5G. So, um, it's grouping it together. That'll be the biggest challenge. Uh, and we we need to do that. We need to do that as a group, as a collective, and collaborate on what we're saying our message is. Yeah, Colette, you, you kind of answered this question when you were describing um, how you maximise the things for your supporters from China and Norway and Singapore and Ireland, what they can do when they come along on a match day. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to what anyone said about how we can best use to promote the North as a visitor economy? I mean, I was just looking actually at some of the comments in the um, in the chat, and I think there's a, a sort of a, a real theme coming out that having a single strategy and a joined up approach is really what we need. Um, you know, I've worked in the north, Northern Powerhouse, Manchester, um, Liverpool for pretty much all my life, and whilst we all talk about it, I think we still hold true to ourselves our own little regions. And for me, if we do want to position ourselves 
as the north we have to let something go so that means sometimes you know we need to shine the light on new yorkshire or shine the light on manchester but i think doing that in a way that um creates if you like what we're famous for the place where the home of i think that's probably where we would get most bang for our buck rather than all if you like sometimes yeah internationally competing in the same space i think it's different like we said domestically and there's huge opportunities particularly this year around that um, but yeah i think we just need to almost be happy being northern rather than mancunian or yorkshire or whichever one it is and i think once you do that you start to open yeah. up much more opportunities that, that's a really good point colette and it, just in the spirit of cooperation it's worth pointing out as andrew dixon has done in the chat that lancashire and bradford are bidding for uk city of culture james you're a, a, a Bradford, Bradford born, weren't you? Used to run Bradford City Football Club, of course. Um, yeah, is that uh, going to work? Is that a good? Is that a good idea? Will that work? Again, just to echo a number of points that we've just raised there, and Colette's right. So, if it's in Lancashire, if it's in Bradford, and we've got Leeds twenty twenty three, it's the North. So, if we're talking about you know investing in the North, we should all champion it. So, why why is it important that Bradford or Lancashire win it? To me, it's an opportunity to attract a global audience, a, a domestic national yeah. audience to the north of the region for whatever it might be so it's going to be culture it's going to be arts and you know let, let's let's underpin the fact that we do have world-class arts institutions and cultural institutions in the north of england so you know as long as it's on that m62 corridor belt that people can get to it we should champion it so bradford getting 2025 would be massive for the region but actually you know it shouldn't detract you know it shouldn't be competitive if yeah. you lose. it will be of course so let's not you know collect doesn't want to lose the title to man city or liverpool but actually if it's if it's a, an english team that wins the champions league we can all celebrate that and i do think the idea of um um compliment complementing each other over competing is that's the north for me so marketing manchester yorkshire cumbria cornwall should have an intra rivalry you know in a competitive healthy way we all want more people to come more often and spend more money collect wants more more sponsors more fans kerry you know wants more people to come to blackpool over elsewhere however if we group it to the north that's it right who are we competing with we're competing with the south we're competing with scotland we're competing with ireland so um yeah, if it goes to Lancashire, we'll support that. If it comes to Bradford or Leeds, we should all support it. Great. So this brings me on nicely, guys, to, to my next question, which is I was going to focus on like the pandemic and what's changed, but I think we've talked that one out, to be honest with you, in so many sessions. But earlier on in this conference, um, obviously we heard from Jamie Driscoll, the mayor of the north, um, the, you know, the bit around Newcastle that they don't quite call Newcastle, but he's the mayor of something up there. And Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester, who does have a um, an economic geography that absolutely maps yours, Shona. They both said the same thing. What's holding the north back is the transport links between them. So you, as promoters of cultural assets, I mean that's that's just massive, isn't it? I mean you, you need that in Blackpool, don't you, Kerry? You need a new transport interchange at Blackpool North. You know it, it could be easier to get to Old Trafford on match days, frankly, Colette. How big, a, how big an issue is this Is this whole advocacy for better transport links and how would it help you, Shona, do, do your job in marketing Manchester to the world? Yeah, I think, Michael, it's a number one. I'd echo, well, I'd have to support Andy Byrne, I wouldn't on, on that, but his, his um, play to say is that he wants a London-style transport system and that's from, the, you know, the beginning and end miles through, you know, bus, bus reform and a good system of connectivity right through to international connectivity is key. I think it's the key to global Britain. It's a key to um, the north and Manchester as a global gateway to the north and an alternative gateway to, to Britain. So, you know, connectivity, to put it in context in terms of levelling up. So if that's the two main things the government's trying to do, level up in global Britain, we in Manchester... Um, airport get 1.4 million international visits a year roughly uh, compared with London's 20 million and so we are the second largest so it's it's a massive you know there's a massive leveling up job to do but when we introduce a direct flight to any of our new markets when we did it with China we immediately then circumvent so Kerry was saying that people would maybe come into um, Manchester do a bit of a trip but we want them to do a 10-day trip and that's what they were yeah. doing. So instead of going into London, going around the UK, and coming out through the Cotswolds, they start in Manchester, do a tour of the north and then leave for Manchester. And that's that's the chance we get. And that's that's the difference that 
direct connectivity gives us uh, for those new markets. Yeah, Kerry, Kerry, any thoughts on on transport and link, linking up, making it better? What could you do? What can your what would your voice say? Yeah, I would echo the sentiment of everybody else. To be honest, I think you know, for us, uh, once upon a time, Blackpool did have a little old airport, uh, and uh, that no longer exists. So we're, you know, well, it does, but for freight. So we're not connected by air anymore. So all of those existing elements of infrastructure that we have, you know, the rail and and the other elements of travel have become more and more important than they've ever been. We don't have uh, budget airlines flying into our town anymore. Um, so I think for, you know, for us as attraction operators and working within the industry, we do. It's key to try and, you know, build those relationships and partnerships with those uh, kind of travel providers and see what we can do to enhance the experience. You know, you touched on whether we need improved infrastructure in Blackpool and, and there is a big project underway um, with the tramways to connect Blackpool yeah. better within itself, um, which will be brilliant for us. And I think, you know, having those key routes in and out of Manchester and, and the other cities are kind of our vehicle to to get in there, really. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Colette, um, I mentioned I had my own little gripe about the tram to Old Trafford on match days occasionally. <laughs> That's important to you, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, ground transport to, to any stadium is important. Um, but I think I'd echo what everybody else said, but I'd add one other thing. Whilst I think it's great because it sells the north and it's great for travel and tourism, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of that infrastructure for the economy as a whole in the north. And I think, yeah. you know, particularly with, yeah, I look around Manchester, we've got some areas where, particularly with the work we do with the local communities, we've got children who've never been outside of Manchester. You know, we they've literally wouldn't know where Yorkshire was, um, so actually, in order for that to change, for their horizons to widen, for them to be motivated and inspired to do something different and feel part of the North, they need to be able to get there. And at the moment, unless they can drive and are willing to sit on a, an M62 in a load of traffic, it's never happening. So I think it's a broader thing. And therefore, yeah. rather than us just relying on it's important for tourism, I think it should be a no brainer. It's important for the North full stop. Yeah, amazing. James, you're giving me the big thumbs up there to Colette's point. Um, anything you want to add? Yeah, I was just writing in the chat there. Couldn't agree more. You know, we talk as an organisation and, and, and Shona will certainly echo this about accessibility and trying to bring, you know, a real diverse population to Yorkshire. So we talk about the Yorkshire Dales as being our sort of, you know, you know, close your eyes and think of Yorkshire, see Yorkshire Dales. How accessible is that? for a family of four from a Bain community in Bradford or Leeds, not accessible for a couple of reasons. It's difficult to get there if you haven't got a car. So you need public transport. Public transport isn't cheap, by the way. And actually it can be laborious if it's a train, then uh, then, uh, then a bus, then a walk. So I think, I think that's a really good point about, let's get the infrastructure right for people within the North to move around so they can work from Leeds to, to Manchester or Blackpool, et cetera, before we then worry about getting international visitors to yeah. Manchester, Leeds, Bradford or Blackpool, et cetera. So I just wanted to say, I think it's an excellent point. Yeah, fantastic. So guys, um, I've, I've asked you there about what difference um, what would make a difference to how the, how the North sold, sold to the world. Um, before we finish, um, a quick fire question that I want to ask you all. And it, 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 here's the rules. You can't answer this by saying it's one of your own assets that you promote. But what are each of you most looking forward to sampling and experiencing in our culture when, when things are open again? And I'll go to Colette first. Well, I wasn't going to say going to a football match anyway because it's an absolute busman's holiday for me. Because <laughs> yes. I, I think I'm actually the envy of most that I've been at every tra every old Trafford match this uh, this season, which is fantastic. But okay. therefore, I probably want a bit of a change, to be honest. Um, I think for me, it'd have to be the food, and we've talked about it in terms of restaurants and bars. You know, Manchester's, I live in Cheshire, Manchester's on the doorstep. I've already booked the restaurants out from the 17th of May every weekend to get out there, <laughs> do some shopping, drink some nice wine and eat some quality food. So, yeah, that's Fantastic. what it would be for me. Fantastic. Thank you, Colette. Um, Kerry? Yeah, my gut reaction to this was to say wine and pub. Um, but I'll also say I'm really excited for the zoos to reopen Okay. Um, and I think my first stop will be Chester Zoo to go and see what they've been doing in lockdown and see the creatures, uh, probably followed by a very swift 
visit to the pub and a glass of wine. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Shona, Shona, what are you most looking forward to? God, there's just so culture? much. There's so much. I mean, I it's international festival. I know I'm not allowed, allowed to say that. I'm a, I think I'd like to go with more than six mates <laughs> and run yeah. around a hill in the Lake District somewhere and then okay. end up in my favourite pub uh, and maybe a restaurant before that. That is it. That's what I want to do. <laughs> well, funnily enough, I have been plotting with friends today a trip to Coniston in October. I'm going to be getting out a long time before October. I can tell you that. But <laughs> um, James, what's your? But we all know Yorkshire's got a lot to offer, and you're a, you've done a great job promoting that. But what are you most looking forward to experiencing culturally? Maybe that's not in Yorkshire. Um, well, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I have to agree with the other three panelists. So if if I ask you this question. What do um, the three greatest um, um, soap programs have in common? That's you know EastEnders, Coronation Street, and Emmerdale. It's the pub. So you t you speak about international visitors from the Middle East, from America, from an area they want to go to a pub and have a British beer. Socialising is what we all want more than anything. It's the one thing that's been taken away from us, whether it's socialising with animals at, an, at, at a farm, <laughs> whether it's at a football, whether it's at a restaurant. You know, it's yeah. human interaction. This is what yeah. we cannot live yeah. without. You know, that, that's the one thing. And I don't really know where it's going uh, to um, uh, matter who it's with anymore now. I'm not, I'm not going to be uh, very, very uh, precious about who I spend my time with. <laughs> but I think it will be that. Just, just, just get it. And, and I think, she said, I've missed music and sport. You know, it's my two yeah. passions. I can't wait to just be sat with my children watching cricket or go to a gig or something. It's that cultural enrichment that we've missed, the theatre. Yeah, fantastic. Kerry, can I just point out, um, you were mentioning about Frank Sinatra and wanting to, always wanted to come to Blackpool. One of my favourite bands, and I might have mentioned that I do a bit of DJing on the radio, is an Australian band called Tame Impala, who are from Perth, where I used to live many, many years ago. And when they did a UK tour, they only wanted to play Blackpool Winter Gardens. It was absolutely Kevin I'm Parker's dream. take that dream. one, thank you. Next time I tell that story, I'll add them to the list. Yeah, you know, you must. And uh, check them out. Absolutely amazing. Done, done a great collaboration with Frank Ocean recently. Just keep an eye on that one. Guys, you've been amazing. Thank you very much. We've got some lovely, lovely praise in the in the chat. Some of it's from people I don't even know, though some of it, I must admit, is from friends of mine, which is very sweet of them. <laughs> but thank you all. Thank you to James, Colette, Shona and Kerry. Uh, you've all been very generous with your time and your insights. And hopefully we've got a great North to go out there, experience and 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 have a look, look round when all this is over. It's my job now to hand over to Alex Turner from the business desk, who I think compliments to him and all his team for putting together a really great day today. Over to you, Alex. Okay. Th th thanks, Michael. Uh, I think that was a great session uh, to end what's been a very, very packed day. We've had 22 sessions, 84 speakers, hundreds of attendees and thousands of ideas and opportunities shared. The thread which has been woven through all of that has been the, the desire and commitment to be part of how we accelerate progress across the North. I think Colette has just highlighted the importance of collaboration. And I think collaboration has been spoken about almost as much as COVID today, which demonstrates how important partnerships will be in driving the post-pandemic recovery. Partnerships have also been really important in put, putting on today's event. So on behalf of the business desk, I'd like to thank our headline partners, EY, Square Pattern Bogs, Impact Data Metrics and Influential uh, for their support and hard work in, in putting on uh, Invest North. I'd also like to thank all of our channel partners and exhibitors, our speakers and facilitators, and everyone for attending and contributing uh, throughout the last eight hours. We hope you've really enjoyed our first Invest North. The second event uh, will take place next year on January the 27th, 2022. So do put that date in your diary. But for now, our expo will be open for a few more minutes. So do pop in there before you uh, check out for the day. Uh, but just to reiterate, I hope you've really enjoyed the Invest North conference. Thank you very much for joining and have a great evening. Thank you, everyone.